Now, uh, we have this truth that we're going to learn today, and it's a deep truth. So we want to go deep and not end up in the deep weeds like a lot of folks do, all right? And we have a single scripture verse. Some of you know it. There'll be many verses to follow. And this particular one is from the 37th Psalm. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his righteousness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Thank you, God. We bow in prayer for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Hear our prayers now. Let this be a time of deep meditation and soul searching in this Thanksgiving season. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Well, we have this hymn today. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. How many of you actually know it? We're kind of losing, you know, some of the sense of our hymnody and some of those great uh, hymns that it's been in the past. But it's actually the backstory that's so fascinating. And I think it's true with all four of the hymns this month. And it works something like this, that there's usually a dark soul of the night that precedes a time of light and delight. Have you noticed that in your lives? It was penned by a woman named Louisa Stead, who seemed to have everything that got stacked against her. First of all, she was born with a rather fragile health, and she wanted to go on the mission field, but she could not. They would not allow her because of her health condition. So she had to stay in the United States. She married a nice guy. They had a daughter. And when their daughter was four years old, uh, one uh, day they went to a nearby beach, and while they were on the shore, um, they noticed a boy out in the ocean struggling to keep above the water. And so her husband swam out to help the boy, and the boy, in his franticness, pulled the husband down. And to the, her horror and to her four-year-old daughter's horror, they watched her husband and, of course, the girl's father die right in front of them. And in that moment, everything went dark. Louise was left with trauma and loss, no financial support, and she was put into abject poverty. She had no means of support. And she finally reached her breaking point one day when there was literally no money in her purse. There was not a bit of food in the house. And she heard some noise at the doorstep. And she came out. And there on the doorstep was a bag of groceries and some money. That afternoon, she went into her little room. And she penned a hymn that's one of the most famous of all the hymns, Tis So Sweet to trust in Jesus. She later remarried, and she, her new husband, and her daughter did become missionaries and spent their lives in Africa. Now, let's just go back to the start and, and think what it had been like if it was us. Can you imagine starting young adulthood? And there's some persons here who are just in that cusp right now. You're just maybe in high school, you're just in college, or you're in young adulthood, and you've got all these dreams, even dreams for God, and they get squashed. Can't do them. Or you get some health problems that happen. Or you f how about this? Pe a person like Louisa Stead finds love, and then five years into her marriage, she watches her husband die in front of her, and she never thinks she's going to get over the horror and the trauma and loss. And then she has great financial difficulties and has no means of getting out. I think she could have penned a hymn that would have said, "'Tis so hard to trust in Jesus." And nobody would have blamed her. Nobody would have blamed her at all. But the truth is, everybody here has experienced some hardships like she has. Maybe not all at once, thank God. You've had some financial difficulties at some time in your life. Maybe you're having them right now. Or a health issue. Maybe you're struggling with some health problem, or you have in the past. Or believe me, you certainly will in the future at some time. Have you ever had a dream squashed? Somebody told you you can't do this, or you're hoping for a job or a promotion, and it doesn't come your way. Or maybe you've lost someone you love, or you've been rejected in love. These are the kind of life events that all of us experience, and those life events can cripple us if we look to ourselves, or they can comfort us if we'll just look to God. And just when she is at a breaking point, Louisa Stead is comforted that God will provide and God will take care of her. And as a result, her life takes a new and a better trajectory. And so she writes, it's sweet. It's sweet to trust in Jesus. I'm going to be OK. I'm going to let God be God. I know it's going to work out. God's going to take care of me. You've heard it said before, probably, when you can't trace his hand, 
and trust his heart. Can I just say it in another way? When you can't see what God is doing, you still have to believe that God's heart is predisposed to you, that God's working it out to good. Even when there's no evidence for it, you still believe it. Um, since we've been doing songs and stuff, there's a, there's a line from an Andre Crouch song. It's called Through It All. I actually thought about getting Brother Daryl Gardner just to come up and sing it. He could sing it really well. But it was, it was a wonderful song a number of years, quite a number of years ago, that won a Grammy. And there's a line that's been in my head for a couple of weeks now. If you know the song, you know this line. It goes like this. If I never had a problem, I would never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. See, the Job, when he was writing, he said, even if God slays me, I'm going to still praise him. Even if God kills me, I'm going to believe that God loves me. You know, there's something about pain. Nobody here wants it. But C.S. Lewis said pain is like the megaphone of God. It gets our attention. You notice that? When you have pain or sorrow or difficulty, it causes you to look upward. Okay, God, what's going on? I'm hurting right now. It causes you to lean into God when you have a hardship. You press up against God. It's been said that every one of us is either going into a storm or you're in a storm or you're coming out of a storm. That's just the pattern of life. Now, I don't want anybody to get me wrong this morning. Please, please hear me about this. Life is meant to be good. God will write many light and beautiful and uplifting stories into the script of your life. There'll be so many wonderful times. Life will be good much of the time. But be assured, Jesus speaking here, John 16, in the world, you will have tribulation. Those times will come. You'll not be immune from them. But then he goes on to say, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus is a man of sorrows, it says in the Bible. It says Jesus was acquainted with grief. There are some moments we will have in lives, our lives that will break our hearts. But Jesus is in the heart healing business. Two weeks ago, I had a brother-in-law and his wife visit for several days from Virginia. And they're, they're a delightful Christian couple. It's uh, Cinda's oldest brother, Mark. He's a dear friend. And he is a, he's a very educated man. He, he has more degrees than a thermometer. And, uh, but the important thing about him is that he knows the Lord. And he knows God's ways. And if you notice, you don't get that from school. You don't get that from schooling. There's a wisdom about him. And one night we talk late into the night. We, we have very similar stories, both of us in the ministry, both of us a lot of years in the military. And in our conversation, we were talking for a while about some of the really hard times, the times of disappointment and struggle and pain and confusion. Like, God, what, what is going on here? This is hard right now, Lord. What, what are you doing in my, my life during this time? Disappointments. And in that conversation, it struck me in a new and more profound way than ever that almost every time I have gone through a season of great difficulty and pain, that was a hinge moment where God was redirecting my life to greater and better things yet to come. And see, what I thought was an apparent breakdown was actually a breakthrough. When you're looking at it human, you think things are breaking down. But if you're walking in the will of God, God is just using that as a hinge moment to propel you into a breakthrough. And it, it's kind of like this. Joy seems to be preceded by a jolt. <laughs> and that jolt gets our attention. Like, whoa, something's happening right now. Things are going to change in my life. And we let us know at that moment that it's God working behind the scenes. Paul put it this way in the Second Corinthians letter. He said, now thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ. I want you to hold on to that verse this morning. It says, God always, always leads us in triumph. God is always helping you and me to be overcomers. God is always assisting us. It's not a breakdown. It's a breakthrough if you but hold on. The scripture put it this way further in that same 2 Corinthians letter. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Hey, if you're looking ahead to your life and somebody said, I'm going to give you six months of hell. It is just going to be tough. It is going to be rough. But I promise you a whole lifetime, a whole lifetime of wonderful blessing. Wouldn't you take it? Yeah. That's what God is saying. 
This is just for a moment. We think of our lives as being forever. You live 80 or 90 years, whatever you live, but we're talking about eternity if we will endure for this time right now. See, God's working it out. Elizabeth Elliot thought this way. She said, look, if we believe in a big God that can control big things, then we must believe in a big God that controls small things. And of course, whether you think it's big or small depends on your perspective. Because if you believe in a big God, everything's small. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. And yet you and I fret and worry and get all concerned that God can't work out these situations that show up in our lives. How about in those moments when we're just wondering, what is going on, God? Instead of kicking and complaining, we just say, God, what are you doing? It is sweet to trust in you. Help me. Fill me with faith. You know, it's, a, it's actually a prayer in the Bible, a prayer in the Bible that a man says, oh, I help my unbelief. I want to believe. You can say to God, give me more faith in this moment. Help me out. And in those times when we're wondering what's going on, I wonder if those are really just birth pangs where God is rebirthing us and growing us to greater maturity because it says in Galatians that God's going to do these kind of things until Christ is formed in you. That's what's going on. God is forming Christ inside of you and me. And you know what? The growth is always in the valley, isn't it? It's not in the mountaintop. We get lots of wonderful mountaintop experiences, but the place we go is when we're down and we're struggling. You see, it's actually our experience with sorrow that increases our capacity for joy and delight. That's how it works. You almost truly can't know pleasure unless you've had some pain. And that is comforting to know that. The Bible says that joy will come in the morning. You've had a dark night of the soul before? I bet you have. But joy will come in the morning if you'll just hold on and wait to see what God is going to do at the end of this story. Now, this hymn, that's the topic of our message, and very the Bible itself says a whole lot more than just being comforted, though. It's not enough to just be comforted by this word of God this morning. The Apostle Paul, writing in that same Corinthian letter, said, Oh, I'm filled with comfort, but I am exceedingly joyful even in tribulation. Are you able to do that? I'm not so good at that sometimes. Like, this isn't fun, Lord. I'm having a hard time right now. Paul said he had reached a place of maturity. He was not only comforted, he was actually joyful in those moments right then. It says in our scripture passage that we read at the start, delight in the Lord. Delight in the Lord. So I started asking myself this question the last couple of weeks. Lord, do I delight in you? And that would be a question for you. Do you delight in the Lord? And what does that mean? So I thought a lot about delight. I asked God, what, what is this? And so I, uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandchildren. They're around, around little kids very much, and they just delight in their play or with a toy or a game. Have you ever seen that? And they just squeal and smile, and they laugh. They're delighting in what they're doing. Or I, I got thinking about young couples who, when they first get interested in each other, and they just start delighting in seeing each other. Do you know what I'm talking about? The, come on, you do. The early stages of romance, you know, where you just can't wait to see that person. And I, I, I thought about um, when Cindy and I started dating in fall of my senior year in college, and after a couple of weeks, I just started delighting in seeing her. I couldn't wait to get up in the morning because I wanted to be with her at breakfast. I just, I just, I'd never been around anybody like this before. She was so unique, and I'd never had these feelings. And I remember thinking, I remember thinking, this girl should be a parking ticket because she had fine written all over her. <laughs> I mean, she just. You think those kind of thoughts when you're in love. You can't. You can't help it. I took her picture so I could show Santa what I wanted for Christmas. See that, you, you, do you understand that? And by the way, three months of dating, we did get engaged <laughs> over the Christmas break. Best Christmas gift I ever had, thank you, Lord. That was, that was very nice of you. But you, you, you see, that's how couples talk when they delight in each other. Uh, Plato said, at the touch of love, everyone becomes a poet. But here's, here's the thing. Love, love makes its own language. When you delight, 
and you love, it makes its own language up. It just bubbles up between you. But here's a funny thing. Couples that so delight in each other when they get started, they think that life and, and marriage is just like a deck of cards. You know, all you need are two hearts and a diamond, right? No, wait, there's more. After a few years, you think all you need is a club and a spade. So I, you know. <laughs> what happens to these couples? It's like they get hit by Cupid, and a few years later, they get hit by his lesser-known brother, Stupid. You know, wh why? What goes on? Because you, you marry someone, you commit yourself to someone who has a hundred or more admirable traits that you love about them, and yet you start to have this myopic vision where you focus on two or three things that you aren't so crazy about. Do you see where I'm going? I believe we do the very same thing with our relationship with God. We do. We really do. God gives you a hundred blessings. God gives you a thousand blessings, and you find yourself obsessing about the two or three things that aren't going that's the way you want to in your life. I, I really believe this whole theme of the sweetness of trusting in Jesus comes with being content. The Apostle Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. It, it's being grateful for who you are, being content with the people in your life, being content where God has placed you, being content with the gifts and graces you have. I mean, friends, we got Thanksgiving coming up in a matter of days. What, what, what a wonderful nation we live in that we have a national holiday where we just say thank you, God, that we can sit down and have a meal free and safe right now. I'm grateful to God for freedom. We just had Veterans Day just a few days ago. Thank you, veterans, for preserving our freedom. We don't have to just thank you one day a week. Hey, veterans, let's stand up. Come on, men and women, stand up. Let's applaud our veterans again. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for serving. Thanks. Thank you for serving. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you so much. We are honoring God when we honor you. We need, we need our defenders. We need our defenders. The world right now is in a turmoil around us. Does anybody not get it? We are going into a storm. Is anybody not following the news? We are going, radical Islam, the demonic hatred for Jews and Christians across the world. Russia, China, North Korea. And the Bible says pray for the peace of Israel. We need to keep an eye on what happens in the Middle East. Middle East, you've, you've read the book of the Revelation. Israel is the apple of God's eye. That's scripture. Pray for their protection. The Bible contains their story. You know, listen, if, if Hamas laid down its weapons tomorrow, there'd be no more violence. If Israel laid down its weapons tomorrow, there'd be no more Israel. They would be annihilated off the face of the earth. So we can thank God that for right now, we can lie down and sleep, and sleep in, in peace and protection and safety at night. That's being content with what we have. Now, delighting in the Lord, though, delighting is more than feeling content and gratitude and comfort. David was a warrior. David, the psalmist, was a warrior, but he was a worshiping warrior. He would get up in the middle of the night and worship God. David wrote seven times a day, I praise you. He would just stop in the day, and he didn't have a, you know, he didn't have a Rolex or something to look at. He just stopped. That was part of the pattern of his life to worship God every, almost every moment of the day. He wrote that he had joy in his salvation. He never forgot his sense of rescue, that God took him from a, sh a shepherd's role in a pasture and exalted him to the throne as king of Israel. He didn't forget where he came from, and it was God that was the glory and the lifter of his head. He wrote songs to God. And when David, the psalmist, went to church, it wasn't like a lot of folks. You know, it's like this box I'm going to check off. <laughs> okay, now I've done my Christian duty. It wasn't like some people that, you know, they kind of the nod to God day. I got to do this thing. David said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. Yes. Do you, do you experience that? I think some of you got that today. You experience gladness when you come to Three Trees, do you? You know why? It's because God is here. It's the presence of God that woos us. Jesus said, if you build it, people will come. 
People will come and experience God in this place, and there'll be gladness and happiness when we come here. David prayed, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you I trust. Boy, when I come to church in the morning, I experience God's loving kindness to me and his forgiveness and his presence. And you know what God said about David? He said, David is a man after my own heart. You know how I read that? God was saying, this is how a human being should be. You want an idea what Christian maturity is? Is that the further you progress in your relationship with Jesus, the more you will delight in the presence of God. God does a heart transplant in us. This is Christian maturity. See, I think, I think it works something like this. I think it works like this. You do not get joy and delight by seeking after joy and delight. That's how the world does it, okay? I want some joy and delight. Okay, I'll go to Wally World. I'll go to an amusement park. I'll go to a ball game. I'll go shopping with Black Friday. You know, I'll, I'll go to a movie. None, all these things are fine, but that is not how we seek God. If you seek God in the same way, you're seeking after God's hand. You're saying, God, give me something. Give me something that will give me joy and delight. It doesn't work that way in the spiritual realm. You don't seek God's hand. You seek God's face. And guess what? When you seek God with your whole heart, you get God. And when you get God, you will be filled with joy and delight. Why do I say that? Here's what the Bible says. In his presence is the fullness of joy. When you get God, you are in God's presence. You will be filled with joy. It just spills over into you. And you find yourself going through all kinds of tough times. And you can say, just like Louisa Stead did when she wrote that hymn, oh, it's sweet to trust in Jesus. I'm delighting in you, even in the times where it's not going so well. Conversely, though, guess what? When you and I deliberately sin against God, what do we lose, first of all? Well, we don't lose our salvation. We don't become an ex-son or daughter of God. God doesn't reject us, but guess what we lose? We lose the joy. We lose the sense of the presence of God. I, I, I've spoken at lots of churches around the country over the years, and there's a lot of churches that are they're joyless. And I have to think right away, well, where's the presence of God? Because if you're in God's presence, joy should be presence there. It, it should be people smiling. It should be people enjoying the manifest presence of God in that moment. And see, the Bible says your sins make a separation between you and God. When you and I sin, a holy God feels, a, it, when we'll, you'll experience on your side, a separation from the presence of the Lord. That's just how it works. You know, if you're spiritually sensitive at all, you would know right now at this very moment if you're near to the presence of God. Will you just pause for a moment? Just look down into your soul and ask yourself questions like this. Do you feel clean? Do you feel you're being obedient to God? Do you feel whole? Are you following God's commandments? Is the fragrance of God surrounding you? Do you have the peace of Christ resting upon you? And see, if you've got God's presence in your life, you don't just have a smile on the outside. You've got a smile on the inside. That's the presence of God. That's the joy of God in your life. Like David, you would say this, I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. And you just want to live right. You want to live a life that's well-pleasing to God. You know, when I was 19 years old and in the army, uh, God filled me with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'd been a Christian since 10. But I certainly did not live a consistent Christian life. Anybody have a story like mine? And if you don't remember it, ask your high school classmates. And uh, they will tell you. I went back to a high school reunion within five minutes of being there. That first time I went back to a high school reunion, I had a guy come up to me and said, Hey, Terry, you remember when you were a sophomore and you got kicked off the basketball team for smoking? Yes, thank you. And give me a cut and pour lemon juice on it. Thank you for reminding me of who I was. But I'm still not that... Pro I'm, there's that person still inside me, but I'm forgiven. I've gone beyond that. And now being filled with the Spirit at 19, for the first time, I had power in my life to live a consistent Christian life. I really felt power. So what am I going to do about Lord? How am I going to change? So here's something I did. I, I, I wanted, like David the psalmist, to begin to delight in God. And so I did something I'd, I've never done since, but for, for a couple months, one day a week, I hopped on my motorcycle 
and I drove to a beautiful botanical gardens there in central Louisiana um, that looked like the Garden of Eden. And I would just go spend the whole day there. I would fast, I would pray, and read my Bible. Now, um, do some of you really experience God in nature? Uh, I did, and, and not only that, but since this is about hymns, the first hymn I ever learned on my grandmother's knee when I was four years old, I remember. Do you know this song? I come to the garden alone. Do you remember this one? Where the dew is still on the roses and my Swedish grandmother was singing it in her broken English. And then she said, the hymn was about me. She said, the joy we share as we tarry there. Of course, my name's Terry. <laughs> and my grandmother lied to me <laughs> about a Christian hymn. But that's, and even to this day, even to this day, I, I, I like to walk and talk to God. I don't, I'm not one for kneeling and sitting much. But there I was at 19, I was in this garden place, and I was just worshiping God. And why was I doing that? Because I needed to reorient my mind. I need to change my habits of thinking. I needed to learn to love God wholeheartedly. And frankly, I did not know what it meant to be all in as a Christian. But I tell you what started happening just being in the presence of God like that one day a week, it started to change me because I was living in the presence of God. And that 19-year-old still lives inside of me. If you see me smile, if you see the, the joy sometimes I have or the delight in things, that's because it's God's presence within. You get to know God, and it starts to change you from the inside out. T uh, Tim Keller put it better than I ever could. He said this, the gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Isn't that a beautiful thought? When the object of your life and mine becomes God, then we can say, oh, it is sweet. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus because you're forgiven and you're loved and you're empowered. 10 days ago, uh, I, I was up at 4.30 in the morning early because I, I was having to leave to go to speak at a Veterans in Faith rally down in South Carolina. And I, I sat for about 40 minutes in the darkness in my living room, and I was just trying to delight in the Lord. I was just trying to delight and think about all the good things in my life. And a thought came to me about the sweetness of a relationship with God so similar to a human relationship, and it's this. The sweetness of a relationship will amplify your desire to further connect. Now let's just think about this. The sweetness of a relationship will amplify your desire to further connect. If a person treats you sweetly and kindly, it makes you want to be around that person more, doesn't it? If you know that this is what our God is like, that God absolutely delights in you and that you're his son or you're his daughter and that God has your picture on the screensaver of his laptop and that God has the artwork of your life on his refrigerator and you know that he sent his son to die for you and that he has been raised from the dead and has given you future and a hope and a good plan, I tell you what, you want to be close to that kind of God. You just want to because it's sweet. It's sweet. The psalmist wrote this. He said, let me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in them. See, you even come to a place where you don't want to sin. I don't want to rupture the relationship I have with God. I don't want to have it cause a separation. I want the pipeline of God's presence to continue to be overflowing. And when you do that, when you delight in the Lord, the Bible says, God will give you the desires of your heart. Some people think God's kind of like a Grinch. If you really get serious, if you're really all in with God, God's going to take away good things. And I'm telling you, it is the opposite. God will fill your life with good things. You're, you expect blessing. You expect favor. You expect honor. You expect good stuff. I tell you, Cind and I have now walked with the Lord for a lifetime, and we know that it is not only true, it is truly true. And then you don't just delight in God's word. You absolutely delight in God's world all around you. Instead of seeing the world in shades of gray and black and white, it just comes alive in technicolor. In fact, it's not shades of gray, it's shades of grace. Life is sweet. It is sweet to trust in the Lord.
I wonder how many of you know that today. I'm going to be inviting our musicians to come up. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, please, to just bow your head. And we're going to look into our souls before a God who loves us and wants the very best for us. You know, there are persons right now who don't know the sweetness that we've been talking about because you don't know Christ. And you long to know that you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus. You need to hear that anything you have ever done in your life is forgiven. And of course, God will do this. You want the sense of feeling clean and having peace on the inside. And it's within your grasp. All you do is turn to Jesus. And you say, God, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me and I trust in you as the son of God. And God will receive it in this very moment. And you know, and I know there's a lot of Christians watching online or here in the sanctuary. And you are thinking right now, I have never delighted in the Lord. You might find it hard to trust God even. Oh, you're in the kingdom, you're a Christian, but you know you worry and fret too much still. You know you do. Or maybe you've got a sin that you can't shake. Or you've got unforgiveness or bitterness in your life. You've got a relationship difficulty. or You've got internal struggles. Of course you do, but God understands. And if you'll just listen to God and draw near to God, God will draw near to you and it'll be like a mood elevator as you get close to God. And what will happen is you'll not only have that smile on the outside, you'll get that smile on the inside. And, and finally, I just, I, I want some of the saints here to hear this. There's some beautiful people here that have walked with God for a long time. You're faithful and volunteering. You're a group leader. You're maybe a staff member at the church even. You're faithful in attendance. You give. And yet you know that as you think about it, you used to delight in the Lord, but you're not anymore. Maybe you're a little bit weary in well-doing right now. And the question is, can I recapture this? And the answer is, of course you can. Of course you can. God wants to give that back to you. And if you will delight in the Lord, God will give you the desires of your heart because you're wanting what God wants. Well, I'm going to say a prayer for all of you right now. If you would, listen and, and pray with me because you're praying with me at this moment. Lord, hear every single prayer that is offered up right now because they're offering it up in faith. And I pray that each one will respond. Let each one, if they need to, to come to the altar, maybe to know for the first time the sweetness of a relationship with you or to a renewal, a recommitment that it is sweet to trust in Jesus as we sing that hymn. So use this time now as a time of coming to the altar and recommitting your life to Christ. And let's agree all of this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.